As we know, the name Yehovah doesn't appear even one time in the Greek New Testament, and so he was looking at different Hebrew versions to see, okay, where do they have the name Yehovah? And as he's comparing Dutile and, and Munster, he sees that they're basically the same version with slight differences, but Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is something completely different. Shalom and welcome to episode four of Hebrew Gospel Pearls. We are in Matthew chapter two, starting in verse 13, and we're going to see how far we get this time. <laughs> we're no longer uh, what we would say, uh, as much as we're trying to go by the sections, we realize there's so much information for each one that we just don't know. So let's just see what happens. Then. I mean, let's get let's started. see how far we get. Yeah. See, yeah. Okay. So let, let's just start with reading it. Um, it's a you know, the, the way that Shem Tov has it broken up, mm -hmm. he has it broken up into 115 sections, the book mm -hmm. of Matthew, and uh, section four is only three verses, which right. is why I think maybe we're going to get more than three verses done this, this episode. But let's see. Let, let me read it because it's such a short section. Yeah. Um, uh, the, they were walking, this is the um, the Magi or the uh, astrologers, whoever they were, these wise men. They were walking and behold an angel of the Lord, and it has hey there for Hashem. We'll get back to that. Mm -hmm. The angel of Yehovah appeared to Joseph. Arise and take the boy and his mother and flee to Egypt. And there uh, remain, stand until I, I tell you. For Herod is seeking the boy to kill. And he took the boy and his son. And he was there until the death of Herod. To, to complete that which was said by the prophet. And from Egypt I called my son. Mm -hmm. So, three verses, that's the entire section. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what's interesting is, is Shem Tov, um, has these critical remarks. We've talked about these. And critical, I mean, in that he's criticizing the Gospels. Mm -hmm. uh, these are called hasagoth, these critical remarks. That's the Hebrew word for that. And you, these 115 sections, I would assume, say assume. <laughs> assume. I would assume the reason is that after each short section, he wants to give a critical remark. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've been looking at is what is his remark after section three, after section four, after section five, and after some of the sections, he doesn't have any remark. Uh oh. And you're left wondering, well, there was nothing in section, you know, whichever section that was to comment on. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the sections, he just doesn't have a comment. Now, like for example, six, section six and seven, he has no remark, nothing mm -hmm. to say. Um, and in section four, he, he doesn't even, uh, well, he does say something interesting that we'll get, get to later. Um, he draws a parallel with Moses. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll get to that this episode or the next one. Mm -hmm. um, but he's comparing Yeshua's life here to Moses' life in the house of the daughter of Pharaoh. So it's, it's really interesting. But he doesn't have anything really of substance to say on these three verses. And I guess there's not. And it's surprising. <laughs> As we'll see, it's really like he could have said something here yeah. that would have been a really good question. Mm-hmm. That Shem Tov didn't raise, and, and, and I wonder about that, um, but we'll get to that. So, all right, can we start with um, the phrase, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yehovah? Absolutely, we must. So, I mean, that is such an interesting phrase in and of itself. Um, George Howard explains how when he was originally studying uh, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, he wasn't looking at, um, he wasn't actually interested in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew per se. He was looking at the Dutile and the uh, Munster versions of Matthew that were published in the 1500s. Munster was a Protestant theologian and linguist. Dutile was a, a Catholic bishop. And around about the same time, in the early 1500s, they both claimed to have found a Hebrew version of Matthew preserved by the Jews. Mm -hmm. They eventually published these Hebrew versions of Matthew yes. in a print, printed book. That's what published means back then, even today. They took the manuscript and they published it. And it was assumed that Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew was the source of those two manuscripts. Well, Howard is looking up a completely different issue. He's not interested in Hebrew Matthew. He's interested in the name Yehovah in the, uh, in the New Testament. 
<laughs> As we know, the name Yehovah doesn't appear even one time in the Greek New Testament. And so he was looking at different Hebrew versions to see, okay, where do they have the name Yehovah? And as he's comparing Dutile and, and Munster, he sees that they're basically the same version with slight differences. But Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is something completely different. Mm -hmm. It is not the same text as Dutile and Munster. It is um, what he came, became convinced was an original Hebrew composition rather than a translation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we should point out that many translations have Yehovah in them. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, they're translations from the Greek into Hebrew. And I just want to pull up here one of the things that we were talking about we wanted to bring, which was um, the uh, Dalich's version. Mm -hmm. So I have here on my computer in, in the Accordance Bible program, mm -hmm. I have Dalich's Hebrew translation. You can also get it online. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you can download it for free in a number of different websites. Dalich's Hebrew New Testament, Matthew 2.13. Um, so let's start with the Greek. So the Greek mentions um, Angelos Kuriu, which is the angel of the Lord, mm -hmm. angel of Lord. And then Dalich has Malach Yehovah, Yehovah with the full vowels, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and Dalich tells you he's translating from Greek. Mm -hmm. We know he's translating from Greek. So why would he put Yehovah in this verse when the Greek had Lord, right? Why didn't he write Malach Adonai? Right. Um, any thoughts on that, Keith? I don't have any thoughts on that, Nehemia, because I'll be honest with you. I'm, yeah. I'm like uh, George Howard when I started looking at this and saying, wait, wait, wait. And, and you're the first person that, that, that brought this to me about the little hay with the apostrophe. And I mean, every right. time I see it, I, I get stopped in my tracks. So. So, so that's an important point there, that a rabbi who's copying the Gospel of Matthew would, it would be very surprising for him to write yud hey vav hey. Right. The rabbis, they'll have a synagogue, and on the front of the synagogue will be a verse, a verse from the Bible. And usually in the verse, it'll say, hey, with an apostrophe, which stands for Hashem. Mm -hmm. Or in some periods, they wrote Yud Vav Yud, or three Yuds, or two Yuds. Mm -hmm. um, and in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, they usually, in, in the manuscripts, we find the hey with the apostrophe. And we all know, everybody who studies any Hebrew manuscript, any modern Hebrew text, the hey stands for Hashem. And that Hashem it means the name, and it represents Yud Hey Vav Hey. And again, even when they're quoting the Tanakh and it's in a synagogue, a holy place, mm -hmm. from their perspective, and they put the name, they don't put yud vav -Hey. Some synagogues do, especially Sephardic synagogues, but most synagogues that I've ever been to do not. They put just the hey when in the, in the verse they're quoting from the Tanakh, it has yud -Hey vav -Hey. Now, I'm looking here in Salkinson Ginsburg's translation. Salkinson and Ginsburg were these two Jewish converts to Christianity in the 19th century. And what's interesting is to compare their translation with Dalich. Mm -hmm. Dalich was a, a Christian, born a Christian Gentile, but he was a great Hebrew linguist. Mm -hmm. uh, Ginsburg was the great scholar of, um, of the Masora. To this day, he's considered the great scholar of the Masora, um, but he was a Jew converted to Christianity. And so it's interesting to, to see the, the comparison. Um, both of them tell us up front, they, they tell us straight out, the purpose of their translation was to present the New Testament in a, in a way that it would be um, very familiar to Jews. Mm -hmm. In other words, they wanted it to sound like the text of the Tanakh, mm -hmm. the text of the Old Testament, because that's what Jews would read and say, wow, this sounds biblical. Mm -hmm. So Dalich, who was a great linguist of the, of the Tanakh, he very consciously um, mimicked his translation of the New Testament after the Old Testament Hebrew. Sometimes he couldn't do it because there'd be a word that doesn't appear in, in, in the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. But he, he did the best to do it. So Matthew 2.13 in Salkinson and Ginsburg. Um, uh, Salkinson translated it, but he died before he finished, so Ginsburg finished it. Um, it says in verse 13, So both Dalich and Salkinson and Ginsburg uh, have Malach Yehovah, the angel of Yehovah, Whereas uh, in the Greek, it says the angel of the Lord. And they could have written Malach Adonai, mm -hmm. Malach Adon, Malach, which is literally the angel of the Lord. But they wrote Yehovah. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, I have a question. Have any... I have a question. Yeah. So, so this is really interesting because, and, and again, this is happening mm -hmm. as, we're, as we're, we're dealing with this in real time. So yeah. can we just ask a question? Why would, sh why would Howard be interested in this topic? Can we? Can we? So, so, so this is, a, in a sense, a mystery. 
that the New Testament does not have the name of Yehovah even one time in the Greek. Mm -hmm. And the mystery is, why not? It, it's 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 um, it's kind of a new, it's kind of strange. Mm -hmm. And one answer is, well, by this time for two hundred years, the Jews had not spoken the name. That's one explanation. Mm -hmm. In other words, what happened is scholars looked in the Septuagint. And the Septuagint never has the name Yehovah. The Septuagint's the ancient Greek translation of the Torah, mm -hmm. uh, and later other books were translated. You mean they, originally the one that they the were Torah. reading didn't have the name. What's that? You're saying that the Septuagint that they were reading didn't have the name. Right. Well, yeah. hold on. I'll get to that. Yes. So the Septuagint does not have the name. Whenever it has Yud Hey Vav in the Hebrew, it has Kurios, Lord, mm -hmm. and sometimes Theos, God. It does not have Yud Hey Vav Hey. And so they they came they they decided based on that. Well, we know the Septuagint was translated in 250 BC, approximately, under the reign of King Ptolemy of, of Egypt when he was creating the Library of Alexandria. He wanted every book in the world, so he brought 70 rabbis or 72 rabbis, according to one version, and they translated it. We're told identically, even though they were in different rooms, supposedly. Long story short, if the Septuagint doesn't have it, the conclusion was people didn't speak the name in 250 BC, and by the time of the by the time of the um, of the New Testament, sure they read Yud Hey Vav Hey in their Hebrew text, but they pronounced it Adonai. That was the assumption, and still is for many scholars. However, what's come out lately is that there isn't a single manuscript of the Septuagint that predates the year 150 that has Lord that has Kurios in place of Yehovah. In every single one of them, it has one of two things. It has either the most common one is it'll have uh, yud hey vav hey in Hebrew characters in the Greek text of the Septuagint, or it will have uh, yao in one instance, which is yota alpha omega, the letters pronounced yao, which presumably is equivalent of the Hebrew yeho, which is the prefix form. 4Q20 in the Dead Sea Scrolls has yao in place of yud hey vav hey. All the other manuscripts from before the, around the middle of the second century AD of the Septuagint have yud hey vav hey either in Paleo-Hebrew characters or regular Hebrew characters. And the takeaway from this is that the original Septuagint didn't have Lord, didn't have Kurios in place of yud hey vav hey. It had the letters yud hey vav hey. Origen, who's the church father, who comes along and he wants to determine what is the most accurate text of the, of the, of the Tanakh, of the Old Testament in Greek, he, uh, he studies the manuscripts of the Septuagint, and he tells us the most accurate manuscripts of the Septuagint, they contain the name of God in Hebrew characters. Mm -hmm. So the question is this. This is the, the $64,000 question. Did the original New Testament written in Greek by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, etc., did they have Lord? And especially in the context when they're quoting Old Testament verses where it says yud heh did they have Lord, Kurios, or did they have yud heh vav -Hey in Paleo-Hebrew characters? Now, we found manuscripts of the Old Testament where it has yud heh vav -Hey in Hebrew characters mm -hmm. in the Greek text, meaning you're reading Greek left to right, and all of a sudden you get a right to left word, which is yud heh vav -Hey. <laughs> right. um, For example, uh, uh, Nachal Hever, they have uh, uh, the 12 minor prophets from Nachal Hever in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, that has uh, actually written by two different scribes. Because mm -hmm. uh, you can tell from the handwriting, there are two different scribes who wrote Yud Hey and Paleo Hebrew characters. Mm -hmm. You have the Papyrus Fuad, you have, and you have other ones. The point is that um, this is this was the question that Howard was asking, and many scholars have asked: Did the original t New Testament have Yud Hey Vav -Hey? Maybe they pronounced it Lord, right? That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. But what they wrote in the Septuagint was Yud Hey Vav -Hey. Uh, did the New Testament have that, or did it have Kurios? That's the $64,000 question scholars have been studying for decades. And Howard said, you know what? Let me look at these Hebrew versions mm -hmm. to see when they translated it from Greek, where did they put yud hey vav -Hey? Mm -hmm. And then he had heard, wait a minute, these, these priests, uh, one a Protestant, one a Catholic, that is um, Munster the Protestant, Dutelay the Catholic, they found a manuscript of Matthew among the Jews, and he looks at that, and then he compares it to Shemto's Hebrew Matthew. He's like, wow, Shemto's Hebrew Matthew is really different from the Greek in many places. Mm -hmm. And sounds like it was written in Hebrew according to him. You know, Nehemiah, one of the things that, that, that does strike me in looking back now 
is that when I'm reading in the New Testament, uh, let's just talk about this verse in 13. And, and when I get to this word, the mm-hmm. phrase, the angel of the Lord, and I know the angel of the Lord is supposed to be, in my mind, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I'm thinking, based on what happens in the Tanakh, in terms mm-hmm. of my English translations, I always found it interesting that they, they're, they're referring to the same capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Tanakh, and yet they make it capital L, small o, R, D. And so for me, I just have to say the thing that was confusing is why would they do that? In other words, what's the agenda? Why would they not? I mean, if I'm reading this and I'm only reading in, in Matthew, uh, why yeah. not treat the fact that they're talking about mm-hmm. Yehovah? Why not, why not capitalize uh, the letters like they so, do in the Tanakh and the explanation right. that they give? So what you're talking about is when the Old, New Testament's quoting the Tanakh, yep. the Old Testament, and in the Tanakh it says yud heh and in English it's written all caps Lord. Mm-hmm. Why isn't it all caps Lord in the New Testament? And the answer is they're translating from the Greek, mm-hmm. and the Greek doesn't have yud heh Yehovah. It has kurios, Lord. That's why. Okay. So, so I, I think what they're doing in a sense is being faithful to the Greek, they're not being faithful to the Hebrew, right? <laughs> That's yeah. where the problem comes in. To say the least. So, all right. Um, I think at some point we're going to want to do a study where we go through every single instance where it has yud heh or actually it's Hashem representing yud heh in Shem Tov Hebrew Matthew. Um, I don't think we'll do that right now. But the fact that they write it here, I think, is simply a function of this phrase that appears repeatedly in the Tanakh. Malach Yehovah, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, mm-hmm. which is always Malach Yehovah, Malach Yehovah, Malach Yehovah. It appears in the Tanakh 58 times, this phrase. Mm-hmm. Now, is it too controversial for us to talk about the way that some Christians interpret Malach Yehovah in the Tanakh? Is that something we no, I, I don't think it's not. I don't think it's too controversial because I have to be honest. For me, again, mm-hmm. look, I, the reason I brought up this issue of angel of the Lord with the capitalization being different is yeah. that in my mind, uh, every time I see Lord, capital L, small o, r, d, um, all of a sudden, as we go through Matthew, we're going to find that, that that word is also used for Yeshua. So, for example, Lord, same, written exactly the same way. Um, ah, you're talking about a different issue here. Well, okay. no, no. The okay. reason I want to bring okay, this yeah. up, though, is, and I'm right on bringing it up right now, is mm-hmm. that, that when I first saw this, I'm always remembering yeah. something. And I'll, I'll tell you what's happening for me, is that yeah. I'm having to read... Um, Matthew completely different than any time I've ever done in my life, including in the last years that I've known you. Because what we focused on when we were working with the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, what we focused on was the prayer that Yeshua taught. And I mean, we went in and we went out and we went around and all of that. And I didn't get a chance to really focus on Matthew as a full text in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. This phrase jumping off the page for me gives me a flood of information and a flood of thoughts. And one of the thoughts is, I wonder if that's why when I would say Lord, L-O-R-D, before I knew anything about the name, before I knew anything about the Tanakh and the Hebrew and all of those sort of things, in my mind, what did it mean? So again, that's why I'm bringing it up. And I think there's a lot okay. of people that are like me that uh, there's a there's a re, um, uh, how can I call it? A, 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 we're having our minds having to be changed uh, in terms of that okay. word. It's, 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 it's not a small thing <laughs> for you, okay, you so like, oh, yeah. but, but for us, it's a, so, it's a big thing. So you raise a really interesting point, which is different than what I was talking about. In yep. other words, we have 58 times in the Tanakh, the phrase Malachi Hova, mm-hmm. and that takes on a theological connotation in some Christian circles, mm-hmm. starting with Justin Martyr around the one year, around the year 150. He, mm-hmm. as far as I know, the first one to bring it up, maybe somebody before him brought it up. We'll, we'll get back to Malachi Hova. What you're talking about is when it says Lord in English, let's mm-hmm. just say in English. And let's say we didn't use any capital letters, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say we wrote everything in all caps or all in small caps. And let's say you just heard it. You didn't know whether there was a capital L, O, R, D or not. Mm -hmm. How do you know who Lord is, right? right? In other words, um, Sarah refers to her husband as my Lord, Mm -hmm. right? Adoni. Mm -hmm. In Hebrew, we can see a distinction between Adoni and Adonai. Adoni means my Lord, referring to a human or an angel. Adonai only refers to God. Mm-hmm. And that tr- that distinction, that clear distinction is lost when you translate it into Greek because Greek just has the word kurios. Mm-hmm. First of all, in, Greeks are, in the original Greek, there is no capital letters. Everything's written in all caps, mm-hmm. right? It's what's called majuscules. Mm-hmm. Um, so you wouldn't have a distinction of, of a Lord out of respect being capital like you do in English. 
because everything is all caps, mm -hmm. right? When Sarah refers to uh, um, to Abraham, she refers to him as kurios, mm -hmm. right? And that's the same kurios that then is used to refer to God. Mm -hmm. So you don't know from the Greek, you only know from the context. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is Yeshua is called kurios, Yehovah is translated kurios when it refers to the Father, and there's a certain ambiguity that's introduced by the Greek. Absolutely. That, but that, let me say something. A, Fascinating. Issue. This was a, this was something that changed uh, for me, and you, you, you may remember. Um, yeah. After our study, we went on tour. We did a bunch of things together, and I called you up and I said, "So I want to ask a question. How many times?" And I'm bringing this up now because it sets the stage for what we're talking about. How yeah. many times where there can be no confusion does Yeshua actually speak this name? And 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 I'm not going to get into okay. all the detail of that. Ooh. But what Hebrew Gospel of Matthew allowed for me is to actually see where that happens. Whereas before that, again, every time I see Lord, capital L, small O-R-D, it's used interchangeably for anything, anywhere, anyhow. And it actually, I have to say, I have to, say to you, um, it confused me until Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And again, it's just another one of the, the, the blessings, if I could say, the pearls of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, that hay with an apostrophe that we've now seen twice. Uh, we saw it in, uh, I think it's chapter one. At, and it was also Malach Yehovah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. So anyway. So, so here's where I want to I want to say we need to take this with a grain of salt and be careful. Okay. So when the Tanakh has Yehovah, and they write in the Hebrew, and Dalich writes Yehovah, mm -hmm. and Salkins and Ginsburg write Yehovah, and Hebrew Ma Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew has Yehovah. Well, I mean, it, 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 you can say it's just translated there from the Greek, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, they saw Lord in the Greek, mm -hmm. and every time you see Lord in the Greek, you have to parse it. Mm -hmm. Is this Lord all caps, or is this Lord capital L, yes. small O R D, or is it Lord all small L O R D? Uh, and you have so you have to parse of one of three options yes. when you see it in the in in the Greek. And so Ginsburg did that, and Dalich did that, and maybe Shemtov did that when he you know if supposing he translated it, maybe he did that. What's interesting to me is when Shemtov Hebrew Matthew has. Uh, Yehovah represented by Hashem, and there isn't kurios in the Greek. That's what's interesting to me. <laughs> now that's and we'll get to that later in a much later episode. <laughs> yes. That's the beauty because there you can't say he's translating from the Greek. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So wow. So this is an interesting topic. Malach. I mean, we just these two words. Oh, can we talk about Malach Yehovah, Angel of the Lord in Christian theology? So there's a, a, an idea that goes back to the second century, at least. Mm -hmm. um, Justin Martyr wrote a book called Dialogues with Trifo, and there he talks about the angel of the Lord he, call, he refers to as, um, he describes as what's known as the pre-incarnate Christ. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the Old Testament, when it says angel of the Lord, according to many Christians, uh, that angel of the Lord isn't just some anonymous angel, as we would get the impression as Jews reading the Tanakh, but actually, that is Jesus making a cameo appearance in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That's a very common idea. Uh, I think it's obvious <laughs> that in uh, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, we've now had angel of the Lord twice. That could not be the pre-incarnate Christ because Yeshua is already on earth, mm -hmm. um, to state the obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then we'll say not every instance of angel of the Lord is, is the pre-incarnate Christ, mm -hmm. but uh, they selectively identify instances of this angel, which I find fascinating as a Jew mm -hmm. to say that Yeshua is an angel because angel means a messenger. Mm -hmm. um, boy, that's the can of theology worms we don't want to get into maybe. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, let's go on in uh, verse 13. What else you got there, Keith? Well, in 13, actually something stopped for me. So I'll tell you yeah. what I'm doing, Nehemiah, and I mean, we. what's beautiful about this is we have different approaches. So one of the things that I'm doing is I'm taking my two English translations yeah. and I'm reading them, and then I'm looking at Howard. I'm looking at the tool that we have. I'm looking at Dalich. And, and for example, when I look at that verse in 13, there is something that jumps off the page for me. Um, yeah. I'm also looking at the Greek, just like uh, you're, you were just discussing. And it says this in all of the versions, including Dalich. It says, and the angel of Yehovah, the angel of the Lord, appeared, and then it gives in all of those versions, except for in Shem Tov, in a dream. In Shem Tov, it doesn't say in a dream. It just says appeared. Now, at this point, when I'm reading in Shem Tov, all of a sudden, Joseph gets another stripe 
on his shoulder in terms of importance. And I'll tell you why. How um, so? When I find in the Tanakh examples of where the angel of Yehovah appears, not in a dream, not to say that that's not important, but when it's not in a dream, but appears to them, it seems to be that there's something that will kind of make me slow down. So again, in this situation okay. in Shem Tov, it says the angel of Yehovah appeared. Now, we're supposed to slow down in Shem Tov. At least this is what I did. I slowed down and yeah. I said, wait, I don't see that in Dalich. I see in a dream. In my English versions, I see in a dream. In most of the translations, it says in a dream. And then there's another phrase later that says that when he time for to leave, he leaves at night. So it's supposed to connect with the idea. He had a dream. He woke up at night. He left. But when I see the angel of Yehovah appeared in Hebrew, I'm thinking again more about Joseph. And it's going to connect two verses later, but I don't want to jump there. Just when I saw that, it made me have a level of respect for Joseph. <laughs> he kind of gets a bad rap, you know. It's not really Joseph in the first chapter. It's the father. But now Joseph gets... A, a visitation. Like, I mean, the angel, I'm talking about what Hebrew Matthew says, the angel of Yehovah appeared to him. Like, like, like how many examples do we see that in the Tanakh where the angel, and I was going through this in the Tanakh, I was going through and I was going to say, have you go on the tap tap and look at it. But I'd like people to do that, to go through okay. and find how many times you see the angel of Yehovah, not in a dream, not in a vision, but appearing to the person, according to Hebrew Matthew, that's what happened. And again, that made me think, wow, Joseph is really something, man. He's, he, you know, it kind of changed, it changed my view of, of him just from Hebrew Matthew. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So um, I just did a quick search here, as you suggested, angel of Yehovah and looked for the word chalom, dream. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find any verses that came up. Um, now, maybe it's in the in an adjacent verse. Yeah. So let's be careful. We didn't do a systematic study of all 58 so, yeah. places right now. Um. But generally, the angel of Yehovah does not appear in a dream. He appears away, uh, when a person is except is, uh, for if you're awake. except for if you're Joseph in the first chapter. What happens is he has the dream. The angel of Yehovah appears in a dream. The angel of Yehovah tells him in a dream. Hmm. But in this one little phrase, it does. It's not Joseph. All of a sudden, had a change. It's not in a dream yeah. now. It's <laughs> interesting. So we have the story in Genesis. You're making me think about yep. what we talked about in Torah pearls years ago. And there, um, uh, Avi Melech, who is the Gentile king, mm -hmm. he's the Philistine king, mm -hmm. Genesis 20, um, where uh, God appears to um, the Philistine king, mm -hmm. the Philistine king, Avi Melech. He takes uh, Abram's wife. And then in verse three of chapter 20, it says, and Elohim came to him, to Avi Melech in a dream at night. Yes. And he said to him, Behold, you're dead because of the woman which you have taken. Mm -hmm. She is married. Mm -hmm. And and then Avi Melech uh, understands he's got to give her back. He he's told he's told in this dream. And he has a conversation with God in the dream. <laughs> so but but she told me that that you know that's her brother, not her husband. Yeah. Um uh so so here that's interesting. So Avi Melech has Yehovah up here. But it's not an angel. And of course, maybe that was an angel, just didn't tell us how Yehovah appeared. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes Yehovah appears to somebody, and we're told that later that's an angel, or, or early in the story that's an angel, but it's Yehovah speaking mm -hmm. because Yehovah speaks through the angel. At least that's the Jewish understanding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting this whole dynamic of angels versus Yehovah himself. Okay. I just thought it was yeah, very I, the reason I say that things change for me is that I just started yeah. looking at Joseph a little bit different. Again, not to diminish the fact that he uh, had this uh, visitation through a dream, but hey, look at maybe he had bad pizza. It was a bad, you know, it wasn't a dream, but just in case there's any confusion, the angel of Yehovah appears to him. That's what it says. Interesting. In the Hebrew Gospel. Okay. Matthew. <laughs> now, um, I was, I was, uh, I want to give credit here to T Bone because I was uh, going over this portion with him uh, in preparation, making some notes, mm -hmm. and he had a great question. Mm -hmm. He always has these great questions. He asked, why did the angel tell them to flee to Egypt? We're commanded in Deuteronomy 17, 16. And it's talking about the king. Mm -hmm. Even so, the king must not acquire many horses for himself or return the people to Egypt in order to acquire more horses. Since Jehovah has said to you, you must never return that way again. Mm -hmm. So we have this commandment that applies to the king, but it's a general statement that God has told us, don't go back to Egypt. And then we see in the book of Jeremiah, yes. there are these people who want to go to Egypt after they assassinate um, uh, Gedaliah, who is the uh, representative of the Babylonian king. They say, okay, now we're in a lot of trouble because we've killed the, the Babylonian uh, appointed governor. 
Even though he was a Jew, he was appointed by the Babylonians. So they say, okay, now we need to flee to Egypt. They go to Jeremiah. He says, absolutely don't go back to Egypt. And what do they do? They take Jeremiah with, with them as a prisoner, and Jeremiah ends up dying in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So we have these two different situations. One is in Deuteronomy, where there's a general statement, don't return to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in Jeremiah, he reminds them, yeah, don't go to Egypt. We're not supposed to go to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And here the angel comes and tells them to go to Egypt. So, so T-Bone asked that question. Um, I blame him. <laughs> it's a really good question. I had. It's one of those things I read before, and I'm, I hadn't really thought about it. What's your thought? But you know, on here's, that, Keith? I got to say the benefit of, of T-Bone, the, the, the benefit of T-Bone is one. And I love the fact that you're talking to him about it because it gives us it gives us now different perspectives, obviously, of this. And and, and the other thing that he's yeah. done, which is not a small thing, is he's actually working with the Hebrew. So he, I mean, maybe maybe that slows him down. I don't know. Wait, so does. tell the people how that's available. Well, yeah, uh, no. So well, doing. one of the things that we're doing now is we're making it available that there's an interlinear. And it's and it's and I think it's 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 a broad brush interlinear, meaning we're taking the tool that we have that has the vowel points there, and we're giving an English word under that uh, Hebrew word. So if you don't know anything about Hebrew, you can at least see the English word. And uh, and again, what what I think that has done for me, and maybe it's doing that for T Bone Nehemia, like you said, you're reading it and you're like, it, it, I didn't think about it. You don't have to slow down as much as as those of us who who haven't had Hebrew to be as uh, what I'd call it as at the tip of our tongue. It's made me to slow down, um, but maybe that's maybe that's what's happening. But I want to say something about the to Egypt issue, mm -hmm. is that when I saw to Egypt, I, I again stopped and I started asking the question. And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. So bear with me just for a minute. Um, last year we did something. We had a call to people. What's called um, uh, readers of the book club, and and the goal was for them to read the entire Tanakh in a year. Now mm -hmm. maybe that's something. And I think you would say when you were growing up. How many times would you read through the sections of the Tanakh? Just when you're in the synagogue. Well, How the often? Torah itself, we, went, we read once a year. We went through the Torah. Uh, and then, you know, so the, the rest of the Tanakh, um, I sat and read it because I wanted to know what was in it. But the average Jew may never read the book of Job or the book of Judges. They might read a section from Job or a section from Judges. Mm. But to read it from cover to cover... I would say 99% of Jews have never even, couldn't couldn't tell you where Job is in the Tanakh. Okay, now here's what's interesting. So I was kind of, now I've gone on this process, Nehemia, where I've read through the Bible, read through the Bible. I used to have a little program called the, the, uh, the One Year Bible, where you'd read through the entire Old Testament, New Testament. That's the way I understood it then. So we did this, this exercise. This is going to relate to this. The exercise was to take a full year and read the entire Tanakh. And so people went through it. And there were many people that would say, you know, I never really knew about X. I never really thought about X. This is tying into what we're going to end up talking about in a couple verses. But when I saw flee to Egypt, immediately I start thinking about who was ever sent to Egypt. And I think about yeah. Abraham going to Egypt. Right. And I think about uh, Isaac or Abraham. Uh, well, Not actually, Isaac, but, but uh, 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 Abraham and then Jacob. Yeah, but then Jacob. And then, and then the next thing that hits me is, I think about Joseph getting this command to go to Egypt. And I think, I know of another Joseph that went to Egypt. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, but again, if you if I start just in Matthew, I don't get a chance to to kind of have that background and it and it, it it illuminates the situation. I guess that's my point. So I mean Egypt, Egypt yeah. being kind of a place that was used, obviously, when we think of Egypt and who came out of Egypt and the importance of the significance of Egypt, man, I mean it it the Egypt issue jumps off the page. I guess is my point. Right. Well, I love I love T Bone's question, mm -hmm. and and I think it has to be one of those things where it remains a question. Mm -hmm. If you believe that an angel actually appeared to him and and said these things, then you know it's not that big of a question, right? In other words, God can, you know, we we talked about this when with, with the uh, the virgin birth story. Mm -hmm. Can God violate His own law? And the answer is yeah, He does all the time. Mm -hmm. Right, he establishes this is the principles for us, mm -hmm. um, but then he can, you know, he may say, hey, like for example, in the tabernacle, or uh, we're told not to have any images before God, and then the tabernacle tells us to make two cherubs, right? So what's going on? I thought God can't violate His own law. Well, yeah, I mean, we if He tells us to do something specifically, we do it, mm -hmm. or He tells uh, Moses to take the rod and on the rod to put the the serpent. Well, we're not supposed to make any graven images. You know, Moses should have, could have said to him, maybe should have said to him, but Yehovah, you told me in the Ten Commandments, all 600,000 Israelites heard it, don't make any graven images. Yeah. Instead, Moses is obedient to God. So if you believe God is speaking to Joseph, it's not, 
it's a question, but it's not really a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, so I mean, verse 14. I mean, I don't know. Can I go to verse 14 or no? We can go to verse 14. Absolutely. So then, so then again, I'm still on Joseph, everybody, just so everyone understands. I have a new respect for Joseph, a new understanding yeah. of Joseph. First, he, we find out that he gets a, a visitation. Second of all, it tells him to go to Egypt. Third thing he does, which immediately made me remember Abraham. <laughs> verse 14. Mm -hmm. And it says, and he arose and he took the child and his mother by night in English. Doesn't say that in the in uh, uh, Shem Tov. And he departed for Egypt. And I think about Joseph being a, I think it's the word, a, a righteous man. And part of that righteousness maybe has to do with the fact that when he hears a thing from the father, he actually does it. So he believes that he's been told to do this and he actually does it. And I think Abraham, go and he goes. I think it's about, I think it's what it tells Abraham, take your son. And the next morning he gets up and he takes his son. So for me, again, when I read that, I think about the fact that Joseph is a person that when he hears it, he actually acts. There's not, there's not, doesn't seem like there's much debate between Joseph and, and, the, and the call. He's in Israel. He says, go to Egypt. He says, okay. He gets up and he goes to, his, uh, goes to, uh, goes to Egypt. And then it says, and, and he was there. No, I mean, can we go to the, th you want to say something about verse 14? Well, so, so I want to say something about Egypt as a character in the story. Oh, good. Uh, in other words, we, we have, we have, uh, you know, we have the angel of Jehovah. We have Joseph. We have the boy who's not named in this, at least this section. We have the mother who's not named. And then we have Egypt, which is named as a character. And, and, and the three times, Egypt, by the way. Three times so, Egypt comes well, that's up. That's interesting. <laughs> so the reason, or I would say one of the one of the points of uh, naming Egypt as a character in this um, account has to do with something that I don't think we're gonna get to this time. We'll get to next time, which is that um, there is a dialogue going on here. I believe between um, I don't want I don't want to spill the beans, but there is this incredible insight you get from understanding the Jewish, under the cultural context here, the Jewish understanding of the Exodus story mm. of Exodus chapter one. And it's something not stated explicitly in the Tanakh, but it's something that certainly the Jews of this time, they believed that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it was told in Jewish legend. And that's something that's in Exodus one that is in Egypt. So Egypt needs to be in the story mm -hmm. in order to tie you. I'll just, I'll just give the, the, the main uh, um, title please, here, the, the headline. What's that? Please do. <laughs> so the headline here is that this account of Yeshua is parallel to the account of Moses, and especially as the Moses story is told in Jewish legend, mm -hmm. right? There were these Jewish stories that, that were told, and you see this in the Targum. We'll get to it next time. I don't think we have time to get to it today. But there's, there's in a sense, more to the story in Exodus 1 in the minds of the Jewish audience in the first century AD than just what's in Exodus 1. Mm -hmm. And part of that has to do with Egypt. So if Egypt wasn't in the story, you might have lost that connection. And Nehemiah, I'm um, going to tell you why I think this is really, really important. And I, and I, and I argue that you know, we weren't going to get to the second section because what's in this, these three verses, and, 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 yeah. it, and it's actually a, how can I put it? Um, it's, a really, it's, it's really an interesting thing because in these three verses, we jump ahead and yeah. we had jump ahead in time. And then the next verses, we go back in the actual present time. So right. there is obviously something really important that Matthew is trying to communicate about mm -hmm. Egypt. And again, we see it show up three different times and he doesn't mention Yeshua. He doesn't mention Mary. He mentions Joseph and he mentions Egypt. And then he does a really uh, amazing thing, which I, I guess we can't talk too much about either, is he, he ends with the Tanakh, with the statement yeah. from the Tanakh, which we have to unpack. And your cousin unpacks it in a really powerful way. So, so I think we'll get to that in the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus, just okay. as a reminder to people. Okay. Uh, we're having this conversation in each episode, talking about the the different sections of Hebrew Matthew, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go even more in depth mm -hmm. uh, in what we're calling Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Mm -hmm. And what we decided to do, because there's two ministries involved, mm -hmm. is uh, one week it'll be on Keith's website, one week next week it'll be on my website. Mm -hmm. So episodes... One, three, five, the odd number of episodes are on Keith's website, uh, bfainternational.com. The even number of episodes, two, four, six, eight. So this episode, which is episode four, mm -hmm. they're going to be on nehemiaswall.com as Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll have to wait for the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus to get to uh, verse 15 
which is a quotation from the Tanakh, and to see how Matthew is using this verse in the Tanakh. Yes. Folks, I want to say something again. Nehemia said it in the last episode. I'm going to say it again in this episode. We don't want anyone to miss this. We don't want anyone to miss the opportunity. If you're serious and if you really want to, to be a part of the plus section, this is a way of us doing two things. One, it's a way for us to go deeper. We can spend more time. (laughs) Someone says, you guys can talk for hours. And and we're only scratching the surface. Nehemiah, we've got all of these resources that we're using. And I know there's some people, and because I've heard from them, that are frustrated that we have these two levels of this. But this is a necessity for us in order for us to keep doing this. The I, I went for a walk yesterday and I thought about all of the people that are support team members at Nehemiah's Wall and, and premium members at BFA. And I want to say to those people, you are the way, you are the reason that we're able to do this. I'm sitting here today again. I think I've got six different things that came through Nehemiah's ministry that he sent us so we could produce this. This is not a small thing. The, the amount of people that are actually putting their hands and their eyes in this, it, it's, it's uh, I don't know how many people there are now, but I, there's a lot of them. And, and We're adding reason, more and more staff by the and, day. And for some reason, done. they won't do it for free <laughs> and they shouldn't. And so here, you guys, I just want to say to you, if you, if you do have uh, the desire to want to be in the plus section at BFA International, Um, There is a way for you to contact us and we will do what we can to make sure that you get there. But I wanted to say again, Nehemiah, the idea has challenged me. It has pushed me, but I think there's purpose in it because we're finding a way to tell people thank you. And we're able to go deeper into the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew with uh, Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. So uh, hopefully we can get into this because this next section is really, really important in terms of understanding what's happening here. I, th- I think in a sense that what we're going to do here in this episode of Hebrew Gospel Pearl Plus, which will be number four, is lay the foundation for how the New Testament exactly. uses the Tanakh. Exactly. Uh, every time it quotes, maybe not every time, but many times when it quotes it, you need this context. Mm-hmm. And then in Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus five, I have one of the most exciting discoveries of my life. I, and, and guess what, folks? I'm so happy. I can't even odd, wait. No, listen. The odd numbers are over at BFA International. Now, tell them, no. Nehemia, for verse for episode four, how do they get to plus? So you go to nehemiaswall.com, uh, become a support team member. Uh, you, you could do that by making a donation. Um, and if you have any other questions about that, you can contact us over at nehemiaswall.com. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Should we end in prayer? Keith, Please. you go first. I'd like to pray. Father, thank you again for... Mm. Just the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to find sources and resources that help us to come at this from a different way. Uh, Especially thank you for what we can learn as a result of this process. Jew and Gentile coming together, using the resources that we have to find common ground, and we're finding it all over the pearls that exist. We thank you that they're coming up to the surface, that people can see the beauty of what's in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. We thank you uh, for what you have done, and we pray that you'll continue to give us grace. We are challenged by technology. (laughs) We're challenged by how to do this, uh, but we're going to keep doing it as long as we have the ability to do so, and we thank you for it in your name. Yehovah, Avinu Shabbat Shammai, Yehovah, our Father in heaven. Yehovah, who speaks to even the Gentile through dreams, to, uh, to Avi Melech, the Philistine, you spoke to him in a dream. And to others you send your angels, awake and in dreams. Yehovah, send your angels and send your message by whatever mechanism you choose to guide us, to guide all those who are calling upon your name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For a more in-depth study, check out Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at NehemiasWall.com and BFAInternational.com. Thank you for your support.